Dude Horrified, the podcast to kill your horror needs. Hello and welcome. I'm Jake Horrifying and today I got a special guest with me, Rob Weedoff. You know him best as John Marston from the Red Dead Redemption video game series. And today we're going to be discussing Red Dead Redemption, Undead Nightmare. How are you doing today, John? Or God damn it, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh. I'm good, Jake. Now listen, that's so funny because throughout all of the production, Red Dead Redemption, Undead Nightmare, and Red Dead 2, they all would say, all right, John, over here. Rob, sorry. I mean, it happens all the time, man. So <laughs> I, cer- I certainly take no offense to it, man. I well, think it's I think it's awesome that just happened. I love it. I just I've been training this whole time to to call you Rob, and the first thing I do is call you John. So that's just <laughs> Well, man, I think it's awesome. I'm glad you did. I will be, uh, I will be happy to be called John. Of course, I would. Yeah. So, right on, man. I'm great. I'm, I'm doing well, man. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's a pleasure having you on. I've been playing as John Marston for half my life now, for 12 years. So, it's crazy to think that I'm having you on here right now to talk Red Dead Redemption. <laughs> well. Man, thank you. I I really appreciate you having me. Of course, this is really awesome, man. Thank you. Uh, have you ever been told that you might be the most interesting person in the world? He is the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> uh, maybe by my wife, but not in the best possible way. No, I'm just kidding. No, um, I I no, I haven't. But it's uh I, i've been told that i'm probably the weirdest person in the world that i have heard that before well i say that because uh i did a lot of research coming into this episode and one of the first things that i came across was that you were the youngest person to ever have a trans like a, a replacement transplant getting your finger put back on after grabbing a bicycle chain <laughs> yes i had a world record man I had world re- a world record that nobody wants, but I did for a short amount of time. It was called the youngest successful replant. And look, look at my hands, dude. So this one is good. This is the one where I reached in and tried to grab the chain of an exercise bike. And, and you can probably tell this is the finger that got chopped off. And these two were just hanging by a thread. I, the lighting's not great in here, but yeah, my finger is like that it's frozen it won't it won't extend i've named it sloth Sloth. (laughs) but yeah so um the youngest successful replant they called they called it and it was honestly i was 17 months old and you know your fingers are 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 just little tiny things at that point then of course your hands grow well they did surgery on my hand so many times throughout my younger years that the scar tissue didn't allow the skin to grow this part right here. And so the bone grew, but the skin didn't. So it hooked because it couldn't grow. It didn't grow because of the scar tissue. Anyway, it was successful because it didn't fall off dead. It's they reattached it and it lived, which means it's successful. And uh, I'm happy to have it, you know, it looks weird, but most people don't notice unless I tell them they don't. So um, it's one of those things. Yeah, that is, that is, I guess, interesting. I would say. I mean, to start, that would happen when you were 17 months. So you were just over a year old to to start off life like that is just kind of bizarre. (laughs) Everything makes so much more sense now, doesn't it? (laughs) The trauma, the trauma. That's what's done this to me. That's what it was. You don't remember any of those surgeries, right? Like all those happened before like the age of five. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Well, so here's what's really crazy. So I didn't, I didn't remember anything about it. I mean, I remember I could see pictures of me as a little kid wearing a cast or, uh, you know, I remember for some reason when they did a, a, they did, they like pricked my finger. A nurse came in and pricked my finger to do some kind of a blood test. I remember that, but that's it from when I was a kid. Well, so when I was a senior in high school, 
I decided I was going to try and have him fix it one more time, just so I wouldn't walk around like this for the rest of my life. Just see what happens. You know, it's like the best hand surgeon in the world. This guy down in Louisville, Kentucky, Dr. Kleinert. So um, I went down there my senior year and my mom and I went to this appointment to kind of just see what, if there was anything they'd be able to do. And Dr. Kleiner started walking down the hall towards our room where we were sitting. And he was talking to a nurse. He was probably 15 feet away down the hall and I couldn't see him, but I heard his voice. And I said, here he comes. And my mom said, who? I said, Dr. Kleiner. She said, what do you mean? I said, I can hear his voice. I remembered his voice. I rem It was so wild. I didn't remember it. Like if you asked me when I was 12, what would you know, Dr. Kleiner? What did he sound like? I, I may have been able to pick it out if I heard it, but I never thought about it. It just, when I heard him coming, I thought, that's him. I know it. That's him. It was wild. It was one of those weird things. So that is it's cool. in here. It's in the it's in the subconscious, I yeah. guess. Maybe it's best if it stays there. I don't know. But. Hey, it stuck with you though. That's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, it was cool. It was wild. So you grew up in Indiana. Yeah. Big uh Hoosiers fan. Oh my goodness, yes, man. And I want to tell you something. We might be for real this year. We just played uh Xavier and beat them. So uh, off to a good start, basketball team. I'm excited about it. I saw them um, in one of their early, I think it was their third game. And I guess if you count the preseason games, maybe it was their first actual game of the season. Anyway, um, had really, really good seats. And it was awesome. And they looked good. And I'm excited about it. So, uh, yeah, basketball. Indiana and basketball, it's like – it's what you hear about. Have you seen the movie Hoosiers? Yes. So uh, they treat it kind of like a religion. They really kind of do around here. And uh, it's it's a lot of fun when I use good. That's where I went to school. It's where I always dreamed of playing when I was growing up. I was never good enough, even close. But still, still love it. Still enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, you left college to go to, to Los Angeles, right? Or was it had you already left college and then gone to Los Angeles? I actually, I graduated college and um, I moved to Chicago, followed my then girlfriend who had a, a job in Chicago. I moved up there because I wanted to be where she was. I didn't have anything lined up. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, ended up finding a really good job in Indianapolis doing construction work, which I really enjoyed and uh, worked there for almost a year. And then moved to Los Angeles. And there I, I lived in L.A. for almost 10 years. So, what year did uh, you get in Los Angeles? Do you remember? Say that again. I'm sorry. What year did you get in Los Angeles? Oh, I think I think it was. Uh, two, 2000. I think it was two th in the year 2000. I think that's when it was. It, it may have been 99, but I think it was 2000. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was because I graduated college in 99 and then lived in Chicago and Indy. So, yeah, long time ago, man. Long time ago. <laughs> That's wild. Ended up working out pretty well, though. Before we go any further, I do want to say spoiler alert for the entire Red Dead Saga and for 16 Blocks. If you have not checked out those projects, you should definitely check them out before continuing further into the video. So your first role was a film called 16 Blocks, which was directed by Richard Donner, who us horror fans know best from The Omen. And he directed a couple of the episodes from Tales from the Crypt. But he's best known from people for Superman, The Goonies, Lethal Weapons. He's one of the best directors of all time. And you were in his final film. That is a crazy thing to say. My goodness, man. I know. When you... I guess when you put it like that, I really, really was fortunate. And I, that that's, you would have to, okay, so you would have to watch the alternate ending of 16 Blocks to see what I did because they they shot two endings and, and truthfully, the one that they chose to put in the movie is better. The It's better for the story, uh, all of it. It's just better. But um, but yeah, I got to work on that. And the, the way that that came about, this is so cool. One of my college friends 
moved to LA and became Richard Donner's personal assistant and was a real creative type guy. He had always been a writer and a kind of a producer and director and an actor and all these short films that he did throughout college and even before. Um, and I think that, you know, all of that, Richard probably thought, yeah, this is my style. This is the kind of guy I want, someone who can help me and we can collaborate possibly and whatever. So um, when I moved to LA, Richard Donner was in the process of having his house remodeled. And my friend, Derek Hoffman is his name and he's on IMDB. He's got some credits and is doing well. I'm really happy for him. Um, but called me and said, hey man, uh, I work for Richard Donner and he's he's kind of moving and we're doing a lot of the stuff ourselves. We could use extra help. Would you be willing to help us? And I said, of course, man. <laughs> so we weren't moving like couches and beds and stuff. We were moving things like his personal collectible. You know, like I've got all this artwork around me in this crazy chicken coop. You know, I've got all these really cool things that people have given me and I love it. I really do. But it was this type of stuff that we were helping put back into his house after it had been remodeled. And so we're talking about like stuff from Superman and stuff from Goonies and the, and tales from the crypt, the chair that the crypt keeper sat in. From no tales from... Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> like that kind of stuff. It was amazing. It was so awesome. And uh, you know, I'm there with my friend who I had known for a long time and Richard Donner, who honestly, man, was one of the coolest, really, really a cool, cool guy. And, you know, he didn't, I guess, the, I guess you would, uh, you would hope that anyone who was in his position would be cool because you look up to him for so many different things that he's done to entertain you and his success and all of the things. He was really cool. And, and that's probably the best thing about it because he, he was interested about me. He was interested about my friend, Derek, his assistant. He wasn't just all about him and he would joke with you and he would tell stories and he was just a really cool guy. But that whole experience was just, I thought, well, I don't know what's going on. This doesn't seem real. It was just so wild, man. But um, yeah, because of that, they had this role in 16 blocks and it was a really small role. And they said, you know, this, I don't know how many months or maybe years after I'd helped them move, Richard Donner said to my friend, Derek, hey, we got to fill this role. You think your, your buddy Rob would want to do it? And so that's how that happened. I didn't audition for it. Um, it was just because I knew the right people that I got that role. But what a cool, what a cool experience that was. I worked with, with Bruce Willis and, uh, didn't didn't really get to know him real well because he was focused and he had lines and it was a big, big part of the movie. If they had used that ending, it would have been a major part of the movie. So it was pretty, you know, he was pretty invested in it. But one one little side note I want to share with you about that experience is in between takes at one point, he was sitting over on the set of stairs that were part, you know, part of the set. We were inside this giant courthouse in New York City. And um he was sitting over there with his shoe off, rubbing his foot. And I could tell like he was really in pain. And I just kind of was, I was standing near him. Um, and I said, are you all right? And he said, yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to try and sound like Bruce Willis, but he's rubbing his foot clearly in pain. He said, I've been walking around with this tiny rock in my shoe for months. And now I've got the biggest bruise on the bottom of my foot. And I said, what do you, what do you mean? Why? I just couldn't, I thought, what are you, get the rock out of your shoe, man. Don't keep putting it back in. <laughs> well, so his character in that movie has a limp and he never wanted to think, have to think about the fact that he limps, never forget to limp. So he placed a tiny rock in his shoe. So it would be uncomfortable and it would make him limp. Wow. It, it's just fascinating. And I thought, Oh my gosh, man, like that's, that's really smart. And really, you really you're really doing it like Bruce Willis is a great actor and he's very famous and 
you know, people would go see Bruce Willis movies because Bruce Willis is in it. But he also, I think, earned, really earned that audience because he was really dedicated and motivated. And, and it was pretty inspiring to see, like, you care, you truly do care that you do this right. That's awesome. Yeah, that is that is amazing. That is an awesome story to hear. Isn't that cool? And I think I said something like, well, man, I, if it's that bad, you probably don't need the rock anymore. Something stupid like that. And he gave me the look, gave me the Bruce Willis look. Like, I'm going <laughs> to kick your ass. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, I got the full experience, man. It was awesome. It was so cool. <laughs> That's all something the- I brag about all the time. Like, oh yeah, I was in I was in a Richard Donner movie with Bruce Willis. No, no big deal. But <laughs> well, the worst thing about that was because it was such a big deal, and I knew it was. I I told all my family, all my friends, I'm in a movie with Bruce Willis. Oh my goodness, I am in a movie with Bruce Willis. I don't say much, but I'm in the movie. And so I sent my whole entire family and all of my friends to the movie theater to watch this movie. That I wasn't in. <laughs> I, it turned out that I wasn't even in it. And I didn't know that until after it was released. And they said, yeah, you're in the alternate ending. You got it. And I thought, oh, dad, God, I wish I knew that before. Anyway, you learn. You got to learn somehow, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Good, cool, cool times, though. Good experience. Were you able to learn anything on the set? Like that was your first role. So your first major role, I I don't think you had anything before that. Uh, So what were you able to take from there? Well, uh, so if you watch it, if you watch the alternate ending, you'll see me run out with this other court officer is what we were called. And we were basically like the security guards of the, of the court. It was a courthouse scene and we were in a courthouse. Well, so we, we run out, and if you, if you watch the whole movie, you know the story leading up to this, but it, I don't know if I want to... I, I kind of want people to watch this movie because I think it's actually a good movie. It's, inter- it's exciting. It's Bruce Willis, most deaf. It was a cool movie, but what I learned was how to hold a gun and look like a police officer. The, the other guy that was there was an actual New York City police officer. And so the first time, you know, action. And here comes Bruce Willis walking towards us. And we run out, freeze, don't move, freeze. And But I'm running up to him with my hand wobbling, like holding a gun. <laughs> and then I had to cuff him. I had to handcuff him. And the whole time, I don't know what to do with this gun in my hand and try it. So that they, they taught me how to uh, make it look way more realistic as if I was trained, which is which was cool. But I guess as far as acting goes, there was a scene later where I checked Bruce Willis's pulse. I'm not going to say why. And, and I had a short line. It's not even in there anyway. They cut it out anyway. But the cameras were, it was a very, very close shot on my face for the one line that I said. And so the first time I said it, I did it real, like really theatrical, you know, like, just one line, but I thought there's no small parts. There's only small performances. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to let it be small. Anyway, I was given notes. Don't, don't do that much. The camera is right on your face. Whatever you do is going to be too much. Bring it way back. And so maybe I didn't bring it back far enough. And and because it was the alternate ending, they were like, just forget it. Just leave it out, whatever. But uh, yeah, I did learn in, a, in an extreme close up. You don't have to do much. <laughs> yeah, the cameras see it all. So, um, yeah, I, it was a cool, cool experience, man. Really good stuff. And in your time between 16 Blocks and Red Dead Redemption, you had a few small roles. You produced a short film or you produced a production I saw, but you worked as a bartender in Los Angeles. Was that did you have fun with that? Oh, man. Yes. Way too much fun. Way too much fun. And in fact, it might have been, I mean, I don't know if I could say this because I don't know if it's true or not, but it was making money. Just need money. 
I was making good money. I was working on Sunset Boulevard. The bar that I worked at was always packed and it was wild. And so it was really fun. And I was making money. I was doing all right. I didn't have a wife or kids. You know, I only had to take care of myself. But I guess because I had money, I started enjoying things in L.A. that I wasn't able to do before I had that job. Before I had that job, I was probably way more focused on how to get an acting job, how to make myself better as an actor, because I was hungry. I didn't only want to be an actor. I also wanted to feed myself. I needed income. I needed to book a job. I was I was interested and motivated to work. When I got the bartending job, I don't, I mean, I'd still, if I had auditions, of course I went, of course I did, but I wasn't as hungry to go after the real reason that I moved out there. So it was a really cool experience and I really enjoyed that too. But um, looking back on it, I don't know in the grand scheme of things, if it was really the best thing that happened while I was out there or maybe it didn't matter at all. Maybe I'm just trying to make excuses on why I didn't get more roles. It's because I was a bartender. That's the only reason why. So now, you know, <laughs> I mean, I feel like you looked out pretty good. John Marston's a hell of a role to get. Oh man. Thank you. And, and honestly, you're absolutely right. I lucked out. And I, and I mean that, I mean that because I don't know, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't know exactly who they had in mind, but they did have some very well-known very established actors in mind for the role of John Marston. And it didn't, it didn't work out for any of them to do it. I don't know why, but then they opened it up to who's, who's going to play this role. Let's audition people and find the guy. So um, it could have been, and I still say this and I mean this, it could have been so many other people that could have played that role and done it really well possibly way better than I did. I don't, I mean, I don't need to get into all that, but I promise you it was, the whole thing was wild. It was a last minute audition. I almost didn't even go um, just because it was like all the circumstances made me think like, no, I don't, I don't want to go for this last minute audition. Nobody even knows what it is. The agent didn't know what it was for. It was called untitled video game project. And we decided that it was probably some kind of a promo for a video game that had already been made. And I thought the the likelihood of me booking this, just like any job you go out for because of the amount of people who are also going out for the same role, that the likelihood of you booking something is very small. And then also I thought, I don't even know what it is. What I mean, I don't know. I don't have any idea what it is. So I'm not real motivated to go because I don't know what, anyway, Thank God I went, right? And also, thank God I didn't know because I would have been really nervous if I did. <laughs> but I feel like, truthfully, I feel like I won the lottery and I, I could not be more appreciative of the experience that I've had because of it. It's It's been such a huge learning experience in so many ways, so many positive ways. The people that I worked with, good people motivated people inspiring people the i mean that's not just people from rockstar but the cast too i mean there were there of course out of all the people i worked with there were some people where i thought you don't get it you don't you just don't get how lucky you are to be you don't appreciate this at all you don't understand it you don't get it and you're you're being a jerk right now and and not that i would say anything to anyone about that but those people wouldn't come back uh the people that were there that worked and enjoyed it and got it, understood the opportunity that they had, worked a lot and really enjoyed it. It was, it was very cool. And um, it, I just, even now, you know, in this very moment, I'm, I'm getting to hang out with you and enjoy this. It's, it's truthfully been the coolest thing that could have ever happened to me. And, and I really, really appreciate it. Do you ever get recognized in public with your voice? Um, I, you know what? There was somewhere. Oh, my wife and I, this is crazy. My wife and I went to dinner, uh, a couple weeks ago in Columbus, which is another small Indiana town, but 
it's not, it's bigger than my hometown anyway, not much, but uh, we went to dinner there. It's probably a 45 minute drive from my house to where we were. It's, I don't know. It's another nowhere Indiana town, right? right. But we were eating dinner. And uh, when we got up to leave, this guy that was seated, I guess at the table right next to us was there with his girlfriend or wife or whoever she was. And he said, Hey, are you, are you Rob? And I said, yeah. And I thought, I, I honestly looked at the guy and I thought we must've done some construction work together because he looked like a construction dude, you know, like he was fit and you could tell that he'd been outside, you know, he's got his beard, like, you know, how we all do. Right. But he, uh, he said, yeah, man, I, I, I recognize your voice. And I thought, Oh my, Oh my goodness. I don't, I don't know you, but you know me because of my voice that, that might be the first time that's actually ever happened. Um, outside of like being at a convention, if I go to a city every now and then somebody at a gas station or someone might be like, Oh my goodness, are you, are you the guy that played John? I heard you were coming in town. So maybe they were secretly looking for me. Right. But, but that guy in Columbus, it really kind of blew me away. I thought, Oh my goodness. He actually recognized my voice because he's a gamer and that's really cool. Um, but typically no, I mean, I, I live in my, hometown right where i grew up and it's a small town so we all kind of know each other anyway and in small towns it's uh news travels so fast right so it's kind of one of those things where it's like anything happens to anyone we all know about it and whatever so like now i think if anybody from my hometown is interested in talking to me because of red dead redemption it's it's my friend's kids who I've never met, you know, but otherwise everyone's like, yeah, whatever, dude, you, I know you. <laughs> I think, yeah, I know you do. <laughs> we're, we're all just people hanging out, doing the best we can. And uh, I did something crazy, I guess, by moving to LA and seeing if I could be an actor. And I, I got it to work out at least partially. Right. You know, I mean, it's, uh, so it's fun. It's fun to everybody can make fun of me and I can laugh right along with them and enjoy it. But yeah, it's it's one of those things. Were you a fan of Western films before you did John? Yes, yes. Uh not definitely not as educated on Western films as Roger Clark is. Oh my goodness. And he he and I sat down and and watched YouTube videos together and he'd say, This is what I was talking about when I was talking about this movie or whatever. And or if we were going to work on a scene, because Red Dead 2, Red Dead Redemption as well, they they try to, to do kind of some salutes to some of these old Western films, you know? And uh, I don't know if salute is the right word, but pay tribute yeah. and, and kind of, you know, do that. Do the Easter eggs for... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Roger would help me understand because he's so well-educated by it. But I loved, loved... The movie Tombstone, I loved it. Probably watched it 50 times. And this is way before I ever had any idea that I was ever going to be in a video game at all. I just really, really enjoyed that movie. I thought it was awesome. And then I liked 310 to Yuma. And uh, I liked Wyatt Earp. And I, you know, I started to get into it for a while, but I never really went back to the old spaghetti westerns and, and really learned much about those I, I do enjoy them now of course i'm interested in them now um but yeah leading up to i guess working on red dead redemption that was tombstone was one of my favorite movies ever so did you use it as inspiration for john uh you know I, honestly um the way that that whole thing kind of worked for me was rockstar they don't give you the entire script at once. So it's not like I was able to read through it and figure out who this character was. I, I was given the script only in, in sections and the sections that I was given were not in order. So, you know, like the, the, the scenes that you would do, you, you would have to ask, I, I, I memorize the lines I understand what's going on in this scene, I think, but I have no idea why this is happening or, you know, what does all this mean? And so the director would have to say, okay, because the director knew the story. 
um, he would explain it to me and, and say, this is what we're looking for. And for the first six months, and we didn't work every day for six months straight. We would work a couple weeks on, a couple weeks off, whatever. But for the first several shoots, I had no idea who John Marston was. I, I mean, I, I realized pretty early on he's pretty grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he gets wound up pretty easy. But it, I, uh, I just had to trust the director who did know the story and you know, continue to do the scenes and, until he said, that's it. That that was the one. That's what we're going to take. All right. And then so as time went on, I started to learn more and more. And then towards, you know, the end, whether it was, you know, I I had almost shot the entire game. Then, yeah, OK, now I know who this guy is for sure. And we would get a scene and I would I would be able to place it myself. At what part of the story it would be and think, OK, yeah. Oh, yeah, cool. Let's do it. You know, Um but yeah, I couldn't couldn't really pull my I was given the information that your character, John Marston, is the toughest guy in this whole entire world that we've created. He's the toughest. He's not afraid of anyone. And that's really about all I knew. And I thought, that's that's a whole lot of information, though. I mean, of course, yeah. I, I get it why they why they told me that, but I didn't really, I didn't know. So it was hard for me to pull from a whole lot of things that I had seen before because I didn't know the character. You know what I mean? So I, w I would love to come ac across as cool as Doc Holliday or, you know, some of these guys in these movies that I really enjoy. Of course, I would love that, but um, I guess I'm not Val Kilmer. I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully it was good. <laughs> At what point in creating the game did you find out that John Marston was going to die? Uh, it wasn't that far into it. And and this is what's so crazy about it. And this is the truth. I know it, I'm not much of a gamer. All right. So that's one thing. I'm not much of a gamer, but I do know I had watched my friends who were into Grand Theft Auto. Um, I think it was Vice City that they were playing. I'd sat and watched them play a few times and thought, yeah, this is cool. This is way different than when I used to play games, which was like the first Nintendo console that came out with Super Mario Brothers, I think came with it, but people would play Zelda and um, I can't remember all the games that we would play. But anyway, that that was like the first console I had, but also the last. So, you know, 15 years later, 20 years later, after I had stopped playing video games altogether, I saw my friends playing Grand Theft Auto and I would see like, oh, you just died. But then you respawn. Right. And so, <clears throat> of course, at that time, I wasn't thinking like, how do they how does the actor do that? Because it's performance capture. Right. We don't just do the voices. We do all the physical movements, too. We just put those suits on. And we act out all of the stuff that you see in the game as our, ourselves. It's not our avatar. It's the avatar is placed on us by the computer, but we're actually moving around in these scenes um, as real people. And we're saying the words out loud as we're, as we're doing that. So that's what you get. When I'm watching my friends play this game, having no idea I was ever going to be a character in a video game, I never thought like, what does that process look like when they're shooting that? And I, and I may have even thought it was almost like a cartoon that people just did voiceover on top of. I don't know. I, I don't know what I thought about it. Anyway, not knowing much about games, we're shooting a death scene of John and I'm going to act it out. I, I'm actually going to take the bullets and I'm going to fall down on the ground and die. And I thought... <laughs> Because I knew that there were still months and months of production left. Um, I really thought, like, he must he must really, really die bad this time because they're having me act it out. But then he's going to respond because that's what happens in video games. That's what I thought in that moment. I didn't realize that that was really him dying. <laughs> the end. I didn't know. I didn't even know. So weird i i know that that's weird and probably not believable but it's the truth I I believe. So, 
That's crazy. That is absolutely because I mean, video game characters do die all the time. I imagine you have to go through like, like in Red Dead Two, you can get kicked by a horse and get killed. So I imagine you have to act out all these different deaths. So it could just be one of many different of these death scenarios that you go through. Yeah, man. And you know, you there were stuntmen for some of the really crazy stuff. Of course, there were stuntmen, and thank God for that because they were. Some of them got beat up pretty bad, not not because they were asked to do anything crazy, but because they're trained and because they wanted also to give the best performance possible. They went for it. And uh, they're, they're crazy. Thank God for stunt people. But you've got like that aspect of it where they would act out some of the crazier stuff. You also have the game engine, whatever that's called. I'm not even sure, but that would take over and, and make people's bo- or characters bodies move in a way that was appropriate to how they were shot or whatever. You know what I'm talking about? You played yeah. the game. So how long did you end up working on Red Dead Redemption? Uh, so the first one, I don't, it's hard for me to know for sure, because I thought that it was, it was spread out for almost two years, right? The whole production that, that I was part of, um, course they created the whole world that you put that you you know move around in and, and stuff like that years before they ever even cast me to be part of it at all but um it was i think spread out for almost two years from the beginning to the end of the performance capture part of it um and and we would do like i said before like two weeks of shooting and then we would do a few weeks off sometimes a few months off and then we would come back and do two or three weeks. And so I didn't work for two years straight. Uh, but I, I feel like I put in about, I want to say about six months worth of, of shoot time. But one of the producers from that said that it was all done in six weeks, which blows my mind. I don't, I, he would know. But I think there's no way, there's no way we did way more than that. But he might have been right. I, I'm sure he's right. Why would he say that? You know, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I guess if if we had done it from start to finish, the performance capture part of it, and we didn't take any breaks, it would have taken six weeks. That's what he says. Was Did you find performance capture difficult to get used to? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, there's so here's here's what's kind of crazy about it. You you wear the the spandex suit, right? Right. <laughs> you wear this suit, and everybody's in. Every actor is in the spandex suit with these little markers that are like reflect. They've got reflective tape on them, and that's what the camera sees: the light bouncing off the tape. I, I shouldn't try to explain this because I don't fully understand it myself. But anyway. They, they basically get a skeleton off of the suit. The cameras pick up this skeleton and then they add the layers of the avatar onto the skeleton. And then the finished product is what you see when you play the game. But uh, when you're walking around in that suit, <laughs> we did get a gun holsters and we wore cowboy boots to make us feel, you know, like, you're cowboys right but we all look ridiculous so that was that was kind of uh it was fun it was funny we all laughed at each other and and uh but as soon as as soon as you started that scene and you realized how focused everyone was and how dedicated to their characters everyone was it wasn't hard to forget that you looked ridiculous because you were then in this in this world you know, you just immediately were locked in and you didn't notice that the person was wearing spandex that you were talking to. <laughs> but so that, I mean, I guess that was something that took some getting used to at first. And then also the fact that these cameras are not, if you shoot a movie, you see the camera, you know exactly where the camera is and you have to kind of play to the camera and, you know, the camera will move for different takes and whatever, but for performance capture, there are, several cameras at different levels all around the room even some on the ceiling shooting down um and you don't know which angle 
they're going to use for the scene. You don't have to play to a camera. So you have more freedom to just be as natural as possible. Uh, but it's almost like you're doing almost like a performance for just the people that are in the room, the director, a few animators, the sound people the you know, it just, it looks totally different than a regular movie set, but you're basically performing these scenes, um, uh, not knowing really where, where there's no camera. I mean, so I guess that's it. And, and of course they, they do a really, really good job of putting it together and making it look like a movie, but yeah, there's, it's, it's just a different, um, it's a different way of doing things. And then also, you know, the terrain in the game and the landscape and all that stuff that you see in the game there, none of that was there. Obviously we weren't on that set. We were just in the same room for the entire production. And if there were, you know, things where you had to walk up a little bit of a grade or you had to step down stairs or whatever it was, they would build that. They would build those things so you would physically do that motion, uh, but nothing nothing looked at all like what you see in the game. So you had to use your imagination a lot. And uh, sometimes they would have you interact with things if they would ask me to pick something up, like a wheelbarrow, for instance. The wheelbarrow that I used on set was not a wheelbarrow. It was a thing that they built. It wasn't heavy and you know it was it was easy to use. Uh, but you know, John's carrying around heavy things in it. So you had to, uh, you know, and yeah. try to sell the fact that it's actually heavy. And funny thing about that, <laughs> funny thing about that, the first couple of times I did these takes where I had to pick up something heavy that, that wasn't heavy when I was in the moment shooting the scene, the director was like, you're so strong, Rob, you're just so strong. Look how strong you are. And I would think, what? What do you and he said that's heavy. You got to remember that that what you're picking up in real life would be really heavy. So you have to sell that. So grunt, you know, and make it look like it's heavy. So I got so tuned into that, that <laughs> when I wasn't on set doing that stuff, but instead doing my regular construction job in Indiana, in between shoots, I would come back and do construction. I would I would all the time be grunting. Because I was so in my head about it that and the guys I work with were like, shut up, man. What are you doing? <laughs> I couldn't turn it off. It was ridiculous. But I mean, it just was. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I, I definitely got some fun fun stories i'm so glad that i can laugh at myself thank god because i'd be in big <laughs> trouble <laughs> how long after the completion of the first game were you invited back for the dlc undead nightmare oh man uh wasn't long it was not long i know that um pretty much at the end of the first game not immediately after but pr pretty close my now wife who was my then fiance and I moved from Los Angeles back to Indiana. And uh, I had started a job doing construction work and probably worked three or four months building this house with this guy and then told him, um, I'm going to need to leave for a few weeks to go work on this video game. And he, he, He's not a gamer. This guy's not a gamer. He knows uh, Pac-Man, you know, he knows things that he played when he was a kid. And this guy was, you know, pr he's probably 60 now, but at the time he was like, you got a, what, what do you do? And I said, I'm a character on a video game. And he, he couldn't put it together. He was like, no, you're not, you're not telling me the truth. Why do you need to leave? And I thought, I... <laughs> <laughs> so wild, but I would say it was, it was six months or less, I would say, from the end, or from the release of Red Dead Redemption that we started. And I could be wrong about that, but wasn't long. Um, the difference was there. We shot Red Dead Redemption in Los Angeles. We shot Undead Nightmare in New York. And so um, I would fly back and forth from my hometown, Seymour, Indiana, to New York. 
and work on Undead Nightmare. It was it was so awesome. Say so we did actually do one shoot for Undead Nightmare was in Los Angeles, and we used the same stage that they used to make uh, the movie Avatar. So that was really cool. Um, but it's just a big open room. It's not like anything special. You walk in there, Hollywood, you know, smoke and mirrors. They they know how to make things look cool. But it, it was just cool knowing that we were in the same room. <laughs> I was just curious, how was Undead Nightmare like pitched to you? Like, what did you know going into it? Well, I knew it was a, it was like a zombie type thing. And uh, I, I didn't, I, again, I didn't have a whole, whole lot of information. They don't tell you anything more than you need to know. And I, I don't know. We all signed non-disclosure agreements, which mean that we can't talk about it. Can't share any information, whatever. But still... I think to protect themselves even more, they just don't tell you anything more than you need to know. And, and you get, you get that because you think, okay, you, you realize like how much time has been put into the creation of this game, building the whole world, all of the time and effort that went into all that stuff before I was ever even thought of to be part of it. They have to protect that. They've already, spent so much money on it they've got investors they have to pay back they have a giant budget that they have to protect you know so um they didn't they didn't say much i could just tell though like this group of people that i work with at rockstar they're all really cool and really fun but they they were like even more so like you're going to love it. You're going to love this. It's, it's really ridiculous. And they were having fun with it. So the entire time, I mean, if you think about it, you know, it's pretty funny. It's, it's it pretty intense at times, but it's really kind of, it's funny. The game is funny too. So we, <laughs> we all had an awesome time on it. Well, Undead Nightmare sticks out because Red Dead 1 and Red Dead 2 are both very emotional games. They're very like, very heavy and they're very much storytelling games not that undead nightmare isn't but undead nightmare is just hey we're making zombies we're making zombies run at you as fast as possible uh we're not making we're not tearing your heart out it's just a pure pure fun horror western game yes yeah and it was too i mean i think they i think they hit it right where they were aiming i i think it was uh a whole lot of fun i think a lot of people feel that way i hear about that a lot when i go to conventions and talk to people face to face a lot of people really really enjoyed undead nightmare are you a fan of the horror genre i i am um i'm i can't say that i'm i'm real educated on that either and i guess to be completely honest since taylor and i my wife had our kids who are 11 years old now we haven't watched a whole lot of anything i mean we've got like our we've got netflix and we've got uh whatever whatever other streaming services we have and she has shows that she likes to watch um i i sit down if i'm sitting down watching tv i'm watching live sports mostly that's that's what i like to do but we're both really busy with you know, we both have jobs and we have each other and we have our kids and we have dogs and cats and chickens and all kinds of stuff we're trying to keep up with all the time. So we have definitely tried to watch movies several different times since we had our kids. But I think we're just so like ready to get rest more than anything. Yes. Oh, I understand. <laughs> We fall asleep is five minutes into whatever we're watching. So it's like maybe we just need to really concentrate on sleeping more and then someday we'll catch up and start enjoying movies again. I don't know, but <clears throat> that's the truth. I don't I I loved Freddy Krueger, Nightmare on Elm Street. I love that. And I will say too, I, I think another reason why I, I didn't really love horror films is because when I was probably in third grade, definitely not older. I might've been younger. I watched the exorcist with a couple of my friends and we watched it at night. So we were at one friend's house 
we had to go back. Two of us had to go back to this other guy's house where I was going to spend the night. And uh, we had just watched The Exorcist and it was nighttime and we had to walk through the woods and there was a trail, you know, but I remember thinking that movie was really, really creepy and scary, but there was just this one part I didn't understand. I couldn't understand what she was saying when she was talking, the girl that was possessed, right? Right. And he said, oh, that's because, yeah, she was talking backwards because the devil talks backwards. And I remember thinking like, oh, I don't like I don't like that. I'm so scared right now to learn that. And it was just like walking through the woods at night with my friend, young kids, you know. I this I think that scared me so bad that I just was like, Yeah, I don't need to watch scary stuff anymore. It's really scary, really scary. So <laughs> maybe I've never gotten over it. I don't know. No, I, f- I understand that completely. I was, uh, before I became a big horror fan, the film Jeepers Creepers, I think I saw that when I was maybe six. Like, it was on, my parents had it on, but my dad was like, he's a good person. I, I, like, there's nothing against him for this. But he's like, yeah, Jeepers Creepers comes after little boys and they're coming for your eyes. And I'm like, oh, oh. this has me messed up. Oh, Scared no. to death. <laughs> Yeah, man. I, you know, you got to come into it at the right time, I guess. I don't think I was emotionally uh, stable enough at that point in my life to be able to separate. This is just a movie. I couldn't do it. it. Scared me. So when they had you come on for Undead Nightmare, were you excited to kind of get into this? I mean, it's not so much horror, uh, but it is, it's got these horror elements to it, but were you excited to kind of dabble into that genre? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely was. I mean, it was, um, you know, I guess in a video game, anything can happen, right? And and maybe not as much in Red Dead Redemption because it's a story that, you know, they they really want to tell a story. Um, and it's, you know, not so much about Easter eggs. Maybe there are a lot of Easter eggs, but it's not. They just don't give you the option to uh, start start flying without, you know, like you can't do certain things. You just can't because it's, it's like in some video games, you can do whatever you want. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, to, to do this, this horror thing, I, I thought I know the story of red dead redemption. Now I'm working with some of these characters that were in that game that I really enjoyed working with, but there's this twist now where we're all trying not to get eaten by zombies and so there was like a whole different vibe to it. And uh, it was really, <laughs> so it was just so much fun. But um, yeah, I didn't, I guess, I guess as far as like really feeling like I was impacting the horror genre, I don't, I guess I don't know enough about it to know whether that happened or not, or whether I ever felt like it was going to try to or whatever, but it was definitely, it was definitely a fun experience. Well, it came out in the height of what I call the zombie era. It was a year after uh, the very first Call of Duty Zombies uh, came out. Uh, it came out a year after Zombieland. It came out one week prior to The Walking Dead, one of the biggest TV shows of all time. So there's this whole era in the late 2000s, early 2010s, where there's this zombie apocalypse love that the general audience had. And you have this this DLC, which I mean, was kind of released as its own game, come out and be a part of that. I mean, it's it's pretty cool to see something like that. <laughs> well, thanks, man. Yeah, I think um, one of the main things that they were trying to do was to get it out before Halloween of that year, which I think they did. But that was I don't think any of them were talking about like we have to get this out before before the walking dead starts you know what i mean like they may have known that that was something that was coming up or whatever but it was more of a let's get this out before halloween because it'll be a great way for people to spend their halloween you know this yeah so it is it, it is the timing was really good for a lot of reasons obviously the way you just 
explained all that, but I don't know that any of that was was uh, something that they had thought about. Well, I think it certainly helped. So having yeah. The Walking Dead come out, having all this interest in that type of genre really helps. And it also helps that IGN gave... This is the first like Red Dead Redemption project to get a 10 out of 10 on IGN to get that critical help too and to see this love for it come out is it's great to see and it really I feel helped boost Undead Nightmare yeah it, I'm sure it did yeah I, I'm sure all that it's it's um it's it's really cool that it turned out Red Dead Redemption and Undead Nightmare I guess really and and obviously Red Dead Redemption too um which is so much bigger than than Red Dead and Undead Nightmare ever ever pretended to be. But you know, Rockstar just to do Red Dead Redemption was a huge gamble for them because they didn't know they they knew that Grand Theft Auto was successful. They knew that, but they they didn't know if Red Dead Redemption was going to be successful at all. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess definitely it helped out that, that they got a 10 out of 10 from IGN. And and that definitely helped people have the, the confidence, I guess, to buy Undead Nightmare or download, you know, however that works. And and know, like, this is this is probably pretty good. That always helps, of course. But um, I, it's, it's really cool that it worked out as well as it did for Rockstar because they really, really took a big chance when they made Red Dead Redemption. So I'm happy for them that it worked out the way that it did. I'm happy. I'm just extremely excited to see it. One of the top five selling video game series of all time, Red Dead Redemption 2 broke so many records with its release. I think the only game that that it didn't quite beat was another Rockstar game, GTA 5. But ah, it just feels so good because I feel like Red Dead came out in a time where the Western genre was kind of dying. So I understand where it becomes a gamble because not a lot of people are talking about the like Western films, but to have Rockstar come out and to kind of, I feel like revitalize this Western genre, even though it's a video game, it's like watering this plant and bringing it back to life. I think that is such a cool thing to see. Wow, that's that's really an interesting way to think about it. But I like that analogy, and I and I love it that it worked out the way that it did too. Honestly, it's it's uh, so many really really good people that I've met through working on Red Dead Redemption, I'm, and I they're the same people that do Grand Theft Auto. They're, I mean, it's the same group of people, same directors, same animators. Of course, you know people change and move around and. and new people come in some people move on to something else but the same core people who make all of rockstar's games and uh that you want them to succeed you want that you're cheering for them they're awesome so and they're good and they're gonna succeed they just are they've proven it too many times now so it's true it's a great it's a great thing to have, have been able to be part of do you ever get to see the concept art for a scene? For example, uh, in Undead Nightmare, you're hunting chupacabras or you're talking to a Sasquatch. Do you get to see this concept art to kind of give your own self this idea of what's going on? Or is it 100% Rob Weedoff's vision? <laughs> well, I can't. There were some things. I like so um, they had this was way, way more detailed in Red Dead Redemption 2 than it was in Red Dead or Undead Nightmare. But you could look on a monitor that would be on the, they called it the volume, which is the area of the floor that the cameras are pointed at. Um, if you're outside the volume, the cameras don't see you. But also on the volume, there would be computer monitors, TV monitors, basically, that were on um, like a stand that they could roll around and whatever, and they would be able to move those to places where you were working and say, okay, so this isn't a full render. This is not complete, obviously, but you can see like the, it would look like you were looking at blueprints for a house and you would see where the walls would be. And you would think, okay, so that you put 
that ribbon, those stanchions in that ribbon or that tape on the floor or however they would mark it so we would know don't walk through this part because you're walking through a wall or there's a tree right here or a big giant boulder or something like that. Um, you could see some of that stuff, but I never, I don't remember seeing anything about the Chupacabra or, or the Sasquatch. <laughs> I think that was all just me just imagining what that might be like. But of course, you know, the Sasquatch, what a jerk. I mean, he eats babies, man. We've lived in these hills a thousand years. You eat babies. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that much, daggone it. I knew that. God. <laughs> Stupid. But yeah, a lot of imagination. So I have some questions here, and they retain to nothing to do with Rockstar or Red Dead Redemption. These are just fun questions for the general audience. So... Hypothetically speaking, Dr. Emmett Brown kidnaps you overnight, throws you into the DeLorean, and takes you back to the early 1900s. Great Scott. And it just so happens to be uh, a zombie plague overtaking the United States, and it is up to you to stop it. So my first question is, which of these weapons uh, is your preferred choice? I have two six shooters, a shotgun, a torch, or a tomahawk. Oh, God, man, those are good options. I think I want a torch. I want a torch. And do you have more questions about that? Or can oh, I yeah. add something else? Yeah, but like you that? can add, go add every, anything you want. I want a horse that shoots rainbows out of its ass. I want a torch and rainbow horse. That's that does like, move almost directly into the next question, which is your preferred mode of transportation. Rainbow horse, man. Absolutely. You don't need if you got a torch and rainbow horse, there's no apocalypse. It's over. It's already over at that point. Let's say you get one companion. Uh, who would you like out of this group? Arthur Morgan, Ash Williams from The Evil Dead, Rick Grimes from The Walking Dead or Alice Marcus from Resident Evil? Arthur Morgan in a second. You know that. Of course you know that. But yes, I want Arthur Morgan for the comic relief. <laughs> that would be that would be a duo. Well, you know what? Arthur, Arthur is an awesome character, and he does have some pretty good one-liners. But you know, Roger Clark is one of the funniest, coolest people in the world. So... I would uh, I would want that. That's what I want. And then my final question is, you need to fortify a city in New Austin. Where do you want to set up your base camp? Blackwater, Armadillo, Tumbleweed, or McFarland's Ranch? McFarland's Ranch. McFarland's Ranch, because I want to know more about that relationship between John and Bonnie. I want to know more about that. And I think other people do, too. I think we all kind of feel like there might have been something going on there and uh, and then realize, no, it's not, it's not going to be what it is. But I think there's more. I think there's more that we need to know about that. That's fair. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just making this up as I go. <laughs> I love it. That's all I could ask for. So you end Undead Nightmare. How long of a break was it between Undead Nightmare and Red Dead Redemption 2? And did you ever think you were going to get invited back i mean your character gets killed did you ever think you were coming back to play john marston i did not man i i don't know how long it was in between uh, a couple years i think at least a full year if not two full years maybe longer it's hard to know that's that's right when my wife and i had our twin boys and it was like couldn't think straight for a long time <laughs> We were, we were like in a different world because we were just so, I guess, overwhelmed, but in the best possible way. But yes, um, overwhelmed. Don't know. Don't know how much time passed. Anyway, um, yeah, I did. I did think it was it. I thought it was over. And when 
Rockstar reached out to me. The director is actually the person who called me and said, want to know if you're interested in doing more work? And I said, yes, I, I would love to, of course. So when he called me, I thought initially that what he meant was just a few days to play a character that was not John on a game that had nothing to do with Red Dead Redemption. Um, because when I worked on Undead Nightmare, one of the characters that that came in and played a role, I don't remember which role it was, uh, but he was someone who had a really big role in the GTA game that was shot before. I don't know if he was a playable character or not, but he was a very big part of that cast. And they brought him back in really just to have some fun and let him be this real character-y character. And uh, they kind of could, you know, relive old times. I thought that that's what he was calling me for because like you said, there's nothing, there's nothing else we can do with my character. It, it's, I mean, you know, it, it is, it's done. So anyway, yeah, I just thought, yeah, two or three days, come back and hang out. I would love that. Can't wait. Um, so a few months went by and they called me again. They, they called me like right at the end of production for um, Grand Theft Auto V. And then it released. And then that was so much bigger than they assumed that it was going to be. They were so pleasantly surprised at the reception that that game got and, and the success that it got. They They did not anticipate that. Of course, they were very happy about it, but right. that pushed the conversations, you know, that I wanted to have, like, when am I coming? What are we doing? You know, that pushed those way back because they were so busy trying to make sure everything was going to continue to stay within, you know, what they were capable of handling with this release. Um, but then, so then, yeah, when, when he did get back to me and said, here's what we're doing it's going to be a prequel to red dead redemption and John is going to be in the game, but he's not going to be the playable character. And I said, yeah, well, yeah, of course I still want to do it. Of course I do. And he said, we're, we're, we don't know, but we assume that it'll be about a year's worth of work. Of course, not every day, like I explained to you before, but probably not, not any more than a year. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. But, I don't live in LA anymore. I live in Indiana, which they knew from Undead Nightmare. They said, it's all right. We'll do the same things we did with Undead Nightmare. We'll just fly out, fly back home. Um, but then I also said, I've got a, I've got a regular job. Like I, I'm not a bartender anymore and I've got kids <laughs> and a wife. It's not just, it's not just me making this decision. If it was, I would say, yeah, let's go in a second. Um, but you know, they, we of course talked about it more and more. And then when it came down to it, my wife and I were, were very happy for me to go there and get started on it. She knows how much I enjoyed working with them. And it, it's obviously an opportunity that you cannot turn down. And I'm so glad that, <clears throat> that it, that it came up, you know, as an option. Um, but I ended up working almost four years on it. <laughs> And uh, enjoyed every second of it and, and wouldn't change a thing about it. If anything, I would say I would love to have worked longer. I'd still be there and still be happy if it was still going on. But um, yeah, it was it was a surprise for sure. Um, but a pleasant one for sure as well. What point in the pro process did you find out you were going to become a playable character? D really, uh, a couple of years into it, I, d I didn't know. I didn't know. Um, and this was crazy, too. This was a conversation that Roger and I had a lot. Roger was a little bit nervous, not a lot nervous, but a little bit nervous that he was going to be in a game with this Red Dead Redemption title, whatever. We didn't know what the exact title was, but it's the same game with a lot of the same. Shouldn't say a lot with some of the same characters from Red Dead Redemption. And if you remember in Red Dead Redemption, some of the reviews were love played as John, but then in the epilogue, we had to play as Jack and that I hated playing as Jack. And he got, I hated that for the guy who played the role of Jack because he was such a cool kid. And now I can't remember his name. 
uh, but such a cool, talented kid. And, you know, people fell in love with this character, John, because it was so well written. In my opinion, it was just a story that everybody fell in love with. And then, and then all of a sudden, you can still play the game, but you can't play it as John anymore. You have to play it as Jack. Well, I said to Roger, man, like he was afraid he was going to get the same kind of reviews as Jack got. And I said, no, first of all, no, because I had been working with him for a few years at this point. And I thought, you're so much better at this. <laughs> you're so good at this. You know, like if I even am in a position to say, but I knew like what a talent and, and this is awesome. And everyone's excited about it. Um, but I said, there's going to be so many people who play this game that never played the first one. They're going to play as Arthur Morgan. And then in the epilogue, they're going to have to play as John. No, they're not going to like that, man. And so <laughs> it was just funny. It was funny, the conversations that we would have about it, because, you know, you work on something for he was there for pretty much five years and he couldn't talk about it with anyone outside of the people that were in the same production who had signed that same non-disclosure. You, you know that you're involved in something that's potentially really, really big. But you you also don't know anything at all because it's not out yet. And there are no reviews. There are not. And so it's funny how your mind can play tricks on you. And, and you know, like I thought, Roger, stop, man. Don't you. There's no. And of course, I was right. No reason to be nervous about anything at all. He was awesome. We all know that it was it was a really cool thing. And he knows that now, too. So I'm happy for him. Yeah, as a fan, I was I was like. Because I loved the character John Marston so much. I'm like, oh, man, we're not going to play as John in Red Dead Redemption 2. And then, like, a month into playing the game, I'm like, you're all right, boy. It's like, I don't know, Dutch. All this talk of Tahiti. You always got a plan, Dutch. And it's like, fall completely in love with the character of Arthur. And then you come back to John, and it's like, damn. Kind of like, <laughs> like the plane is Arthur. I know, I know. That was really, really good, though. You did a really good Arthur Morgan. I love it. Oh, it, that's year, like, that's years of just. I don't know. That's my favorite thing. That uh, I, I believe it's a real line. I hope I didn't come up with it. But he's like, I don't know, Dutch. All this talk to Tahiti, like, I don't know. I love, I love the character. I love Roger and what he did with Arthur. I love you and what you did with John. It's, it's so. Uh -huh fun to see yeah it's uh it was really a cool experience and i'm glad that it turned out the way that it did it's very fortunate so did you notice a difference between playing the like acting out playing a playable character versus being a side character yes yes and here's the biggest difference and one that i appreciate so much so much so when you're the playable character you get into these situations where you know there's going to be a gun battle or there's going to be a fist fight or something intense is going to happen. So you get, you know, you're doing the scene and you're real, real intense right up until the point of where that physical big moment happens. And as the playable character, you just have to then stand in like what they call an idle position where you're just standing there with your arms down to your side. And you then let the, the person playing the game control what happens next. And so, of course, that's way better for the person playing the game to have the control over that part of it, right? Because that's the right. fun part. As an actor, you're like, oh, man, I want to do this so bad. Well, so as a non-playable character, you do get to do it. You do get to run around and, and, and throw punches and, you know, so... <laughs> I mean, I guess I guess the only people that would realize exactly how that feels is people that have been a playable character and not had that opportunity and then get to be a non-playable character and enjoy all of that. And that's That was a huge thing for me. I really enjoyed it. Do you have a favorite memory on the set of RDR2? Oh, goodness. I, you know what? There, there are so, so many great memories and probably more that i've forgotten about than i actually remember it's been you know there with the 
the amount of good memories that I have, of course, you're going to, you're going to forget. But of course, if somebody reminded me, I'd be right back there and think, gosh, that was so cool. We had such a cool group of people. Again, not just the people from Rockstar, but the cast too. And uh, supportive, cool, motivating people and, and funny. It was, it was a party and it still is. I'm telling you, we still stay in touch. The, the cast, I, I don't think a lot of us are interacting with Rockstar. Maybe some people are. Um, but we as cast members have a text chain and we all text each other on a regular basis. And it's always funny. And it's always, you know, it's either making fun of each other like friends do, or it's uh, lifting people up or celebrating people's successes. It's, it's a really cool, cool thing. So I, I don't know if there's one specific thing about being on set that I can say this was definitely my favorite moment. But like I said earlier too, I'm still, I'm still enjoying the part that I was, the, the fact that I was able to be part of this experience to this very moment, I'm still really enjoying the friendships that I made, which I think is the most important thing, you know? Yes. Uh, and so, yeah, it's still happening and I'm, I, I love it. Well, I have one last question. <laughs> I don't know if this question is even allowed to be answered, but when filming Red Dead Redemption 2, which came out four years ago, was there ever talk of an Undead Nightmare sequel, prequel, uh, DLC that would coincide with the release of that, which obviously won't happen anymore. That's four years gone. There could be another Undead Nightmare game, but not with the release of Red Dead Redemption 2. So was there ever talk? Is that something that people wanted? I know that all of the cast wanted it for sure. Yeah, we all talked about it and, and probably all pitched our own ideas to Rockstar. Like, let's do it this way. And then, you know, as if we have control at all <laughs> about what they're going to do next. Um, but I don't know. I mean, that would be one of those things where if you ask anyone at Rockstar, are we going to do this? They... They see they fall under a whole different set of rules. They signed the same non-disclosure that we signed, but they've also signed several others too, I'm sure, where they just can't. You just learn after a while. You don't ask questions because you're putting someone in an awkward position where you, you know that they can't answer. So you just don't ask them anymore because you think if I, if I need to know this, you're going to tell me and you'll be happy to tell me. Um, but if, if I'm just curious and just want to get some information, they're not telling you anything. They can't, you know? So, yeah. um, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that, you know, we've talked about a thousand different ideas for DLCs that we're all going to be part of and enjoy so much as a cast, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember Rockstar ever saying anything about any further work than what we were currently working on you know than what we were working on at the time that never it's just not what they do it's just not part of this it's just not it's just not what they do so um yeah i want there to be something i i definitely want there to be more and i think a lot of people want there to be more and and i will say this too i think there will be more i don't know if I will be part of it as John Marston, I don't, I have no idea. I hope that that would be the case, but they said, and this is not me, you know, saying something that hasn't been said by rockstar games and take two productions. Red dead redemption is a franchise at this point. This is something that hopefully they will be, you know, shooting red dead redemption six, 30 years down the road or however long it takes to get there, you know, I don't know if they will or not, but I think they've definitely got uh, something good going and, and they've got a whole lot of different opportunities as far as which direction they want to go next. They, they just do. They've developed too many characters with storylines that they could run with, that people would be excited to know more about. Uh, they could go back in the past even further and we could learn more about things that we have heard about but don't really know what it looks like and 
um, who knows what they'll do, but hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, and this is me saying this, hopefully they do something soon, and hopefully I get to be part of it. <laughs> I would love, I would love Red Dead Redemption 3 to be a story that talks about everything leading up to the events of Blackwater. Like, that would be so fun. And for them, if they took the element from GTA 5 where you could play as three different characters and go through each different character and have, like, you are you and Arthur and Hosea and have you three as different playable characters that would be a ton of fun in my opinion or having Dutch as a playable character would be super cool to have I would love to see something like that man I would too I I I think that uh I think a lot of people are excited about the possibility of something like that so hopefully hopefully that will happen I I truly don't know I'm just hoping like like everybody else that wants that is hoping, but it's fun to talk about. And I don't think I don't think that any idea is a stretch. I think that there are a lot of good ideas that people have, including yours. Uh, I don't think that that would be something that you should think it's never going to happen, though. It might. It, it might happen exactly like you just said. I have no idea. But hopefully we, we'll be pleasantly surprised soon with something it would be great wouldn't it it would well it's been an absolute pleasure having you on rob this is a dream come true for me uh oh, thank you man i've really enjoyed it too thank you like i said you are the most interesting person in the world it feels like from the beginning to the end uh <laughs> Thanks, man. Well, hopefully I can keep it interesting. I guess if there's anything I'm good at, it's uh, being, I said people probably say I'm, I'm the most weird person in the world. I'm good at that. I'll try to keep it interesting. I'll try to keep it going. Right on. Well, Thank is there you. anything you want to promote to anyone while you're on? No, you know, um, I guess not. I, I, I don't have anything in the works right now. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to think of even like other cast members that are doing stuff. Look at uh, Gabrielle Sloyer has a show on Netflix, but uh, Gabrielle Sloyer played Javier Escuela. He's doing some stuff. Ben Davis, who played Dutch Vanderlyn, has some stuff coming up. Be very excited about both of those guys. Of course, Roger is always doing audio books. He's always, always busy. Um and, and he's got a short film that's doing well. Well, and then also uh, there is some, I guess there is something that I'm part of that Steve J. Palmer is much more part of. And it's a movie called Lulu and the Electric Dreamboat. Uh, Patty Murphy directed it. And it's a film that was made in Ireland. And Steve Palmer's got a pretty good sized role in it. And it's a really, I think it's going to be a really cool movie. Indie film. Um, and I have a voiceover role in the movie, very small, very small, but I I'm excited because I think it's, I like the people. I like Patty a whole lot. He's really cool. Um, of course I want to support Steve in any way I can, but the, the cast and crew that I was able to interact with, uh, for my small part, my small contribution to the film seemed really, really cool. And I want the best for them. So I think they got something pretty special too. So there's that. That's awesome. We look yeah. forward to seeing more of you, Rob. Hope to see you in a ton more Red Dead games as well. Thanks, Jake. Thank you, man. Thank you again so much for having me on too. I've really, really enjoyed it, man. Thank Absolutely. You. And I hope everyone that's watching had a great Thanksgiving and is having a fantastic Black Friday. Please like, comment, subscribe. Do whatever you want, though. If you want to leave a dislike, it's fair. But until next time, stay horrifying, my dudes.